I'm supposed to have Sadie Lavoie, Lavoie sorry, um, moderate the panel, but unfortunately she is sick. Um, so um, we will be having Hannah, our wonderful colleague, um, moderate the panel today. Um, and I'll pass it over to her to introduce herself and then get started. So thank you all for being here. Thanks, Lena. Is this on? Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay. Um, well, yes, unfortunately, instead of Sadie, you have me today. Um, but I'm really excited and honored to be um, facilitating this panel and uh, about to have a great conversation um, with four leaders in the climate movement. Um, just quickly to say a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Hannah Muhadrin. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a settler of English and Sri Lankan descent, originally from Saskatoon Treaty 6. And for the past six-ish years, um, I've lived here in Winnipeg on Treaty 1 territory. And I am the national campaigns manager with Climate Reality Project Canada. Um, so uh, I'm going to quickly introduce our four panelists, and then we'll get into some questions. Um, so right to my uh, right here, I have Walter Andre. Walter is a Métis man living in Slave Lake with knowledge in Indigenous-led land use assessments, a familiarity with Métis nation governance and rights, and experience in some best practices for Indigenous participation, collaboration, consultation, and intercommunity partnership in environmental impact assessments. He loves the land and the entire beauty of Mother Earth and all its natural wonders. He is also a trained climate reality leader and a rock hound and mushroom lover. <laughs> um, and next we have Daniel Kanu. Daniel is an Anishinaabe, Irish, and Métis man from Animaki Wajing in Treaty 3 on Lake of the Woods. He eventually moved to Winnipeg where he pursued a biology degree. Since then, he has worked in the last 17 years assisting Indigenous peoples around Turtle Island to strengthen their food, land, and water self-determination. He is currently the director of the Lake Winnipeg Indigenous Collective, a group of First Nations who a group of First Nations who have come together to advance Indigenous knowledge, values, and practices to protect and restore Lake Winnipeg for all future generations. So, welcome, Daniel. Um, next, Leah Gazan. Leah it was first elected as the Member of Parliament for Winnipeg Centre in October 2019. I don't know if anybody else here lives in Winnipeg Centre. I do, so Leah's my MP, and that was a really exciting moment. Um, she is currently the NDP critic for children, families, and social development, as well as the critic for women and gender equality, and the deputy critic for housing. Gazan is a member of the Standing Committee on the Status of Women and the Standing Joint Committee on the Library of Parliament. In 2019, she introduced a private member's bill, Bill C-232, the Climate Emergency Action Act, which recognizes the right to a healthy environment as a human right. In August 2020, she submitted M46, which calls on the federal government to convert the Canada Emergency Response Benefit into a permanent guaranteed livable basic income. In December 2021, she built on this motion by introducing Bill C-223, the National Framework for a Guaranteed Livable Basic Income Act. As an educator, advisor, and media contributor, Leah Gazan has been deeply engaged with issues and organizing in Winnipeg's core for nearly three decades. Gazan has spent her life working for human rights on the local, national, and international stage. Her contributions in Winnipeg have both shaped our understanding of her collective struggles and strengths and helped move us towards justice. As president of the Social Planning Council between 2011 and 2015, Gazan organized and pushed policy in support of an end to poverty, addressing violence against women and girls, finding solutions for housing insecurity and homelessness, ensuring fair wages and community-based actions, addressing addictions and proper supports for mental health. Gazan was a prominent Winnipeg lead during Idle No More, articulating the movement to the Winnipeg public. She also co-founded the We Care campaign, aimed at building public will to end violence against Indigenous women and girls. Gazan is a member of the Wood Mountain Lakota Nation, located in Saskatchewan Treaty 4 territory. Phew, <laughs> you've done a lot. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, we have Clayton Thomas Mueller. Um, Clayton is a member of Treaty 6-based Matthias Colomb Cree Nation, also known as Pukatawagan, and located in Northern Manitoba. 
He has been recognized by Yes Magazine as a climate hero and is featured as one of 10 international human rights defenders in the National Canadian Museum, Museum for Human Rights. He has campaigned across Canada, Alaska, and the lower 48 states, organizing in hundreds of First Nations, Alaska Native, and Native American communities to support Indigenous peoples in defending their territories against the encroachment of the fossil fuel industry, with a special focus on stopping the expansion of the Canadian tar sands and its associated pipelines. Clayton is an award-winning film director, media producer, organizer, facilitator, public speaker, and best-selling author on Indigenous rights and environmental and economic justice. His book, Life in the City of Dirty Water, is a national bestseller and a CBC Canada Reads finalist. So welcome to all of our panelists. We're so um, honored to have you here today. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, getting into the first question here, and I'll just hand the mic down. Um, oh, and you guys have your own over there. That's great. Um, the first question is um, reflecting on your own involvement in the climate movement. Um, what challenges have you faced centering Indigenous leadership? Um, and how do you think conversations and actions would be different if Indigenous leadership was more central to um, climate and conversation uh, conservation work? Um, so, Walter, I'll hand it to you here. Uh, good, good morning. Um, thank you, uh, Elder Ger Geraldine, for the prayer earlier on. The Love the words that you spoke and then the, the wisdom that you impart to all of us who are here today. Appreciate your your, your blessings. Um, I'm from uh, the lands of the people of Treaty 8 um, and live uh, also on the lands of the uh, lesser slave Métis people. My uh, history in that area goes back uh, many generations uh, to some of the to the original inhabitants, but it also comes back to here and um, through the through my Goulet roots, through the fur trade. Um, I, think, I look at some of the challenges that we have today where I live, and uh, it directly, it's directly uh, attributed to land use. What I mean by that is that, that immense tracts of land have been changed by industrial development both by forestry and through oil and gas development. And uh, just recently, you know, we've had, we had a, if uh, we had record wildfires in, in Alberta, if you want to think about a, the a size of area that was burnt and it was just down the road from me, I can tell you, and people may have seen on the national news, a whole bunch of people who were, um, who were evacuated from the East Prairie Métis settlement. That's about a half, an hour, half an hour to 45 minutes drive from where I live today at the, uh, at the end of Lester Slave Lake. And, uh, you know, many of, many of uh, our, our Indigenous people have been evacuated over various years because of the, the wildfires in the, in the, boreal, in the boreal forest. Uh, essentially, 22,000 square kilometers burnt last year. It's a record setter, even by Alberta terms. And, um, and out of all of that, uh, we, we, have, uh, we have a government that doesn't understand both the plight of Indigenous people, their, their separation from their homes. They're, they're sort of taking away the culture and the landscape, both by industrial development, but also, you know, some of the animals getting, getting, getting hurt and damaged and their own habitats being destroyed by 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 wildfire the animals will come back but right now it's it's quite a hit and we see more bears coming into town we see uh um, more animals on the road that that kind of thing so from a person from a perspective of the you know the metis nation and the people that i'm i i, I work with um back in uh 2017 i'm part of an organization we've got Today, I think we've got about 60,000 members throughout the province of Alberta. And we had an annual meeting to, to address a climate 
policy. So in 2017, there was a unanimous approval at one of our annual get-togethers on, uh, on an ordinary resolution for the for the Métis Nation of Alberta to undertake a climate change initiatives. And indeed, we did that back in the day when there was a supporting uh, provincial government and the federal government has always been supportive of that as well. And so we've taken, you know, the, the leadership has taken various steps by, by um, you know, building, uh, building solar power installations to sort of uh, offset some of the greenhouse gases that are, uh, you know, involved in, uh, in, in properties of the nation. Um, we've got one sitting on our office in, uh, in Slave Lake. But, um, uh, and there's, there's a whole bunch of others, First Nations, that are actually undertaking these, these projects as well. But I should say that, that, you know, like as a climate person, you know, I'm all for um, renewable and all for renewable energy. But we also live in a province in which the majority of the funds that that go into the public purse sort of come from oil oil revenues and that kind of a thing. So it's the same with First Nations out in that area. Is you know they're 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 all working to make it better for Mother Earth. At the same time, when they when they also have people who are working in the forestry industry or the oil and gas industry, it's kind of a a, a, a treadmill. And then, and then they end up losing their positions because you know the activities are shut down due to forest fires. So, so who's to stand back to kind of understand these things? I think I think the native leadership, um, indigenous leadership, both for First Nations, Métis, and everyone that cares about Mother Earth should come together, come together, and and talk about what they want with not only within their host communities looking after each other, but also what can be done with the country to for all of us to get off of this resource revenue stream that continues continually damages the land. We need to move to another more holistic way of of, of existing on this planet. So uh, you know I don't have all the answers. I, I feel that there's uh, there's opportunities and and challenges i've been part of the climate movement i think i became self-aware back in 1990 anyway of the whole climate movement and the and climate change and then i went to uh did, did some university in in alberta and then came out as an environmental scientist and then you know take took that into uh, account and i worked that into much of the work that i do with elders today is explaining to them some of the science that we, that we when we undertake projects or the review of industrial projects on the land is uh, you know a lot of times I go out and do um, traditional land use assessments on these areas that are going to be that are going to be cleared. So I take the people out onto the land and they usually have a story about a a, a cabin that was there or 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 a family get the gathering that had taken place out there back in the back in the old days. And you know we look at the changes on the land, and we document that, and then submit that to the the regulator and the government so that they understand and maybe can go around particular areas and uh, save that piece of land because of its important importance to the people. But having said that, I think uh, there's a lot of challenges ahead of us, and I and um, I've mentioned this in other uh, workshops, is that. The environmental movement um, uh, should get closer to indigenous communities. Should get more involved in in bringing elders to to well to these events and other events, and and receiving the guidance of, of people like myself and my members who are on the advisory committee. I I have to say that you know um, I've been on the committee now for several years. And I've really enjoyed uh, my time on that committee because the, the the leadership who run this movement are are really interested in hearing what we have to say, and uh, and it's just it's just wonderful to to work within this organization to address these these big big picture issues that you know a lot of you young people are going going to be dealing with your entire lives. Um, now, if I can just uh, say maybe one more thing. I think a concrete action would be to 
to have uh, a, a really good a really good um, indigenous engagement uh, policy for our, our our organization. Uh, part of that could be utilized in other um, in other ways. A lot of um, so one of some of the animals that we have out in where we live are the caribou. There's four caribou ranges just within within uh, about two or three hours of where where I live, and there are there are species at, at risk, being affected not only by the fires but also by the industrial industrial development, and uh, I, I think that if we we could look at perhaps maybe highlighting some of those 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 changes to the uh, to the environment and how some of these larger mammals may be affected by by climate change and and or industrial use because the two things are kind of tied together that maybe we can we can strike a note more with the with the general public and and well embrace uh, some of the knowledge that the caribou brings to the you know indigenous cult culture and uh, to to the world anyway that's uh, I'll, I'll stop there Okay, well, I think where I want to start is just to think about uh, I mean, climate, climate, climate change. That the whole that whole movement is uh, is through is being done through colonialism. Uh, and when I when I talk about colonialism in this sense, I want to I want to I don't know, bring it to just this idea of disconnection with the land. So when we when we think about um, when you think about the land, uh, the types of decisions that get made uh, made on the land, if you can, uh, if you're disconnected from that, if those decisions are disconnected, um, it changes what what's done. Uh, take changes what's built, uh, changes how things are adapted, and and bringing uh, indigenous people rights holders to those uh, decisions uh, are going to change what happens. Um, I think if you think of that just on a scale of something like hydro, you know, hydro is is uh, often talked about as this part of our our green uh, approach. How we'll, uh, you know, how we'll we'll adapt to climate change. We'll you know, it's this green energy, all these things. Um, but yet, it's still it's still managed in such a way that it's about uh, the production side of it, and not about who lives there. Uh, not about and by who lives there, I don't just mean uh, us uh, as First Nation communities or people, but also uh, you know on medicines, uh, plants, animals uh, that use the area and should and have that right to continue to use that area. Um, but hydro isn't doesn't just have to be one thing or the other. It doesn't just have to be uh, all about the economy. It can also make they can make different decisions, right? Yeah, we know where the decisions are being made. They're not in that area. They're being made from a disconnected point of view. And, and we see this all over, right? So we see this with mining, right? We see where, you know, when we want to, when a mine's being built, it's not being built by the people of that area. It's being built by uh, someone from far away, you know, just this continue, continuous colonialism. Um, I'm I'm really concerned about uh, plans for climate mitigation that um, things like the uh, portage diversion, which will bring flood water uh, coming down the Assiniboine, uh, but instead of but sends it north. Right? Uh, in order to allow that, the the province has had to put forth a plan to uh, create uh, outlet channels uh, that drain from the from Lake Manitoba into Lake Saint Martin into Lake Winnipeg. Um, those current plans really are going to, uh, in some cases, intensify those floods for those uh, northern communities. Uh, these are places uh, and peoples who still have not been able to go home after uh, initial floods were directed their way. Um, that decision was made, of course, to uh, to save other people, right? To prevent flooding from uh, harming uh, agricultural land along the Assiniboine, uh, from preventing essentially new housing divisions built on floodplains uh, in and around Winnipeg. And 
and th the result is we have communities have been torn up uh, and really not properly cared for in any way. I would have always thought that if you make a decision to harm someone, that the first thing you need to do is address that harm, right? Uh, but of course, it's still lingering, you know, and um, and those decisions are being made today, right? That where there's a there, the province will be putting forth a plan to um, uh, to the federal government to make a decision on whether that should be built and further entrenched. And once that's built, there will be more diversions up north. It'll be at, it'll be permission to just continue to flood up north. Um, and the outlet channels are supposed to reduce the harm there. Um, but make no mistake, if you continue if you continue to divert and divert more often, uh, you will continue that harm. And and the problem lies in that. Well, why aren't we looking at the, uh, what's bringing these floods forward? Why are we draining the land in Saskatchewan and Alberta? Uh, you know, we 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 suffer from we're, we're expected to suffer from droughts, from floods, uh, from some unpredictable weather. But I think it's predictable that we're going to get those uh, uh, those challenges. And if we allow uh, drainage, uh, well, the impacts will be felt. Except. If uh, through our adaptation plans, we can just send it up north and, and make someone else deal with it, uh, then uh, that's a big problem. And and I, as I've, I, I haven't done as much, I think, in climate change as, as uh, the other panelists here. But what I've noticed is that the, the supports for First Nations, uh, for Métis communities, have always been about the mitigation side, as if we have to somehow uh, fix this problem that's been put on us. Um, and yet the adaptation, it's it's there to some degree, but it's not it's not enough. Um, when we see uh, ice roads disappear, it's it's uh, it's that's a that's a huge harm on our our communities. Um, effects to like hunting, fishing, gathering, our ability to be on the land, all those things are being uh, being affected, and we don't don't have those resources to to adapt to it. Instead, we're uh, you know being asked to further uh, green up our, our our transportation and things like that. Um, and then when I talk about land, uh, we we often talk about indigenous knowledge, and I think there's uh, a lot of ways to define it. So it's something that is. You know, there's a lot of diversity of knowledge systems throughout uh, Turtle Island. Uh, but one of my favorite ways of talking about it is it's just that connection to the land. And that that's today, right? So that's being on the land today. Uh, that's uh, having that knowledge passed down from your, uh, you, you know, your, your father, your mother, your uncles, your aunties uh, uh, down the line and having that connection to the land. And I think that part of like strengthening knowledge systems, strengthening communities is about maintaining that connection to the land and fighting back against some of these measures that will pull us away from that. Um, further, when I, whenever I talk about knowledge, I, I really wanna make it clear that uh, this isn't just stories or something like that. This is what we've, uh, we've built uh, over many generations that has, uh, really kept the land uh, and our, our our peoples like healthy and and surviving and thriving and and we've done so uh, you know within our communities but when uh, when industry and government wants to come and talk to us about indigenous knowledge I think they're forgetting that or uh, there's this there's this idea that science has to be has to be part of that conversation, and uh, I'm a big I'm a big fan of science. I I'm, can get really geeky about that stuff, but it frustrates me so much how uh, we pour you know the Canadian government pours you know billions of dollars into uh, universities and institutions to support science as a knowledge system. So that supports students to learn, supports uh, profs and researchers to gather more information. 
uh, and their ability to then connect with policy systems uh, is is pretty good because of that, right? They, all those supports go a long way for uh, for a person who who's practicing on the land who has that knowledge. He did not have those supports, right? His ability to pass on that knowledge to his his family uh, and, and other youth in his community are is often compromised and does not have the resources, uh, even close to the resources that we see for scientific community. And so I think it's important to remember that while you want to engage with knowledge holders, there is a huge uh, power imbalance and resource imbalance that has continued to this day. And just to point out too, that th these resources, Canadians resources comes from the land, right? It's been extracted and pulled from there that profit has goes to science and other things and never back to our communities. And uh, there'll be more to say about things like that. Did I hear the question again? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I've been taking little, I'm not texting. If I'm writing on my phone here, I've been taking little notes to try and tie everything back in. Um, but uh, the question uh, was um, just around, I guess, uh, challenges that you faced in centering Indigenous leadership in the climate movement. Um, and then how do you think those conversations and actions would be um different if Indigenous leadership was more central. So I feel like Daniel was talking about, you know, thinking about adaptation rather than just flowing money into mitigation was like a good example as well as, of course, like um, the connection to the land and land-based practices. Right. So just want to start out by saying how nice it is to be up here with the panelists. Uh, our our frontline warrior, Grandma, Grandma Shin Goose, uh, it was so nice to be surprised by your good words and presence today and so nice to be up here with my brother from another mother, uh, Clayton, uh, today uh, to talk to you. Uh, I, I was kind of a last minute thing, but I thought these are my people, movement people. I was, uh, I always say I was elected by the movement. I continue to be funded by the movement, and my heart is still with the movement, even though I find myself in what I've lovingly nicknamed the colonial misogynistic racist shithole uh, called the, the House of Commons that I have to sit in, uh, you know, 130 days a year, right? Um, so because I'm the only woman on the panel, I want to center this discussion also around gender. Um, I'll talk first of all about the focus on the climate action movement around white supremacy. Uh, you know, you cannot separate uh, the climate movement from indigenous rights, from uh, rights to land, which are often uh, looked at separately and this flows across party lines. Uh, you cannot talk about uh, protecting the climate in absence of Indigenous people and Indigenous rights. I'll give you an example. In BC right now, and I've been very public about my position in the House of Commons, if you look at what's going on in Wasuetan territory, right? Talking about uh, development in the absence of, of of uh, indigenous rights, exactly what's going on in that territory and how it is connected to not only violence against the land, but violence against indigenous women. And one of the uh, examples I use is, and we know this very well, it's been reported at the UN level, the militarized police violence uh, that's being facilitated by the RCMP against Indigenous women land defenders who, uh, during a police raid, had a chainsaw and an axe and dogs uh, smash down their door. Now, if we want to talk about normalized violence, normalized violence to land, 
normalized violence to Indigenous women, you cannot separate it. Uh, one of the things we did this year, I put forward a study, or I think it was last year, I don't know, it's all a blur of, of colonial hell since I've been in the House of Commons, but I put forward a, a study connecting uh, increased violence against Indigenous women and girls and resource extraction. You cannot separate the two. And what I said, it got unanimous consent across party lines. But what I said is that I don't want to talk about whether you agree with resource extraction or not. Whether you agree with resource extraction or not, or aggressive actions against the land, you know where I stand. Whether it's happening or not, we have to look at the kind of violence that's perpetrated against women and girls. And I got the study through and it got passed unanimously because no matter where you, you sit on this spectrum, acts, violent acts that are occurring against our lands, waters and, and resources are also occurring against Indigenous women and girls, particularly around resource extraction projects where we see, um, uh, you know, um, the development of man camps, uh, normalized violence in communities where companies come in, companies come in without safety plans for communities to reap the benefits off our lands, leaving us with all the garbage behind, whether it's to our waters, to our lands, or the violence that's perpetrated against our communities that result in intergenerational trauma. And it's ongoing. The question was, how would it be different with Indigenous leadership? And this is what I have to say, and maybe it's not popular, but I don't think it's unpopular. I think it's the real talk. You know, we are diverse as Indigenous peoples. We come from diverse experiences. We have diverse relationships uh, with the land based on violent colonialism, including in my family, that disrupted those relationships with my lands, with my territories, with my resources, having become or having been a descendant of a child welfare survivor whose mother went, my grandmother went to residential school, was on the streets when she was 12. We have diverse experiences. So this stoic notion about the mystical indigenous person and their relationship with lands, I think we need to get over that because it's an erasure of our diverse histories that have been violently disrupted by uh, colonization and the violent dispossessions of our lands. It erases the truth of the histories uh, that have occurred in what we now call or some acknowledge as Canada. And I share this with you because now we've been left in many of our nations with what I call a false choice. Uh, it's either you participate in resource extraction or you starve. That's the option. I don't believe that people love oil and gas. I think that is a load of garbage. You know, all the pins that say, I love oil and gas. I don't think people love oil and gas. It's not like you go out for coffee with oil. How you doing? How you feeling today? There's not a romantic relationship with oil. You've, I don't think you can talk to oil. It comes from the ground. But what people love is feeding their families. They love being able to have a house. They love being able to support their children in what they want to do. And many of our nations have been presented with that false choice and a notion that's grown out of neoliberalism of what success is and what wealth is based on the great colonial lie that mystifies us as Indigenous people with one thought, one idea, and one experience without all of our diversity and that we even share on this panel. I'm sure if we sat down and spoke about our diverse experiences, it would be very different. 
which is why I'm putting forward a guaranteed livable basic income. Because if we are going to get out, I don't think it's about right or wrong choice. That's really easy to make those choices when you're privileged. It's easy to make the choice whether you want to work in the mine or save the land when you have the financial resources to do so. We need to provide real economic solutions so that people have real choices, real choices to get retrained, real choices uh, to pursue other careers. For example, the care economy, uh, jobs in the care economy, uh, but require the financial resources to do so. We cannot look at moving into a just transition they talk about without providing families and communities with the economic choices to be able to have the privilege of making those moral choices. Now, I know how I feel about resource extraction. I know that when they wanted to, I have come from a very small community because of land dispossession. We used to be nine by nine and now we're three by three. And on our little parcel of land that's left, there was talk about opening, because we have a natural spring, about having a water bottling plant, right? Because we need economic resources, to which I said, like, our whole community will turn into a water bottling factory. Like, we have no land left. I know how I feel about that, right? Um but it's also about respecting the free prior and informed consent of nations. And people don't really understand what free prior and informed consent is. It's free prior without coercion, a prior to any sort of development, knowing what you're agreeing to. And if you have all three and you've and you have all three, then you have consent. And what we face right now in the country is you know, um, a legislation that was passed, Bill C-15, uh, to uphold the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which includes the right to free power and informed consent of Indigenous peoples. And this is how it's one thing to change laws. It's another thing to change colonial behavior. So here's how free power and informed consent works in this country. We will respect your free prior and informed consent if you tow our political and economic agenda of resource extraction. And if you don't, we will send in militarized police to disrupt your community so much that we will usurp your free prior and informed consent and we will uh, extract your resources regardless. That's the reality which is why you cannot separate climate justice from human rights, climate justice from indigenous peoples, regardless where we sit on the pendulum of resource extraction. You cannot separate the two and you cannot separate uh, resource extraction without a gendered lens because the people that are impacted the most who are often not at the table are indigenous women. These decisions are made in our communities. And this certainly, if you want to read the uh, study that came out of the status of women, where we are impacted the most, where we get the low level jobs in these places, should we choose and experience the most violence uh, without even being invited to the table. And this has happened in Manitoba, whether it's about hydro, whether it's about oil projects, uh, we need a seat at the table uh, when decisions are being made, uh, especially when it relates to our Mother Earth, because we are the life givers. And the same disrespect to our life giver is the same disrespect that you see with the ongoing genocide of Indigenous women and girls around our lands, whether it's in urban centers or whether we're trying to live out who we are on our traditional territories, we need to speak out against violence. You cannot look at these things as separate. So I'll leave it at that. Um, that's my rant. I'll probably have nothing more to say. And just one last thing is that in these climate spaces, 
we need to stop centering these climate spaces around blinding whiteness. It's the same sort of erasure of intersectionalities that I have to listen to when we're talking about climate in the House of Commons, which is often we're talking about impacts on the environment, void of people. We are interconnected. We are interrelated. And you cannot talk about water without people, without our four-leggeds, without our water, our beautiful sky, our fire. It's all interconnected. So I'll leave it at that. And I'll hand it over to my good brother, Clay. Yeah. All right. You want to repeat that question one more time? <laughs> Sorry, I'm at the end here and I'm getting old. <laughs> sure thing. Um, so it's a question around reflecting on your own involvement in the climate movement. Uh, what challenges have you faced centering Indigenous leadership and how do you think um, the movement and climate action would look different um, if Indigenous leadership was uh, more central? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Well, first of all, it's really, really awesome to be here. Uh, good morning, everybody. Super nice to see you all. And uh, yeah, um, I just want to acknowledge the organizers, all the hard work you did to pull us together here. Um, I, I just continue to be baffled that I'm like, like I get to check off like the leaf as, ooh, I did a public presentation there. I like, it's like one of my personal hobbies of like wanting to present in every single venue in Winnipeg <laughs> before I'm dead. And uh, you'd be surprised. The list of places left is very small. So um, I, I think that there in of itself is a really big difficulty that the climate movement has been faced with, has been wrestling with is trying to center indigenous leadership. I think the woke folks within the climate movement, you know, are, are on a never ending treadmill to, to do that, to try and accomplish that. Um, but, you know, when we break things down from a social movement change theory perspective, like our how to, our know how, our op, op, our mode op or whatever it's called, um, you know, we, we got to think back to like the 90s, like 99, Seattle, WTO, battle in Seattle. You know, we 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 fucking won. Like we we knocked back uh, the new world order, free market, predatory, economic capitalist framework a decade. You know, we forced them government, the G8 economy club to go into bilateral free trade agreements over the next 20 years because they didn't succeed in consolidating their grip on the global economy uh, in 99 at the WTO, the battle in Seattle. And the way that social movements did that is by executing a very strong framework of international solidarity. You know, um, it wasn't about centering the climate movement's leadership around indigenous peoples, you know, per se. It was about showing up for your comrades and struggle. If you're liberation, if your struggle was tied in with another social movement sector's liberation and struggle, then you showed up for each other. You know, we see that happening right now, the world over in a reinvigoration, if you will, of the global anti-war movement with the neo-colonial genocide that is happening right now in, in Gaza, you know, by, by Israel. And, you know, um, we see people rising up all over the world, you know, to to stop a bad thing from happening. And and we've seen this time and time again. And people forget um, there's an amnesia. And I think it's exacerbated by social media technologies, maybe um, certainly by by, uh, you know, the, the ongoing separation of community, the erosion of community. You know, and I'll tell you something, at the end of the day, the, the solution to climate change is not big global trade agreements like the Paris Climate Accord, which, you know, the, the only objective of the Paris Climate Accord is to commodify the remainder of, of, of nature, okay? And that's the, the atmosphere, the Earth's carbon cycling capacity, right? They want to turn the atmosphere into a dump 
where only the 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 richest players get a chance to buy into dumping in that dump you know in that shell that's bp you know that's even hydro you know the the number one uh uh polluter in this country when it comes to methane gas it's right there in, in the government of canada's own report everybody thought it was the oil sands but it ain't it's it's canada's vast hydroelectric network of 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 reservoirs when you submerge vast tracts of the boreal rainforest underneath water um you know mercury exists and everything is a natural element it gets released on mass floats down to the bottom of the reservoirs it you know gets eaten up by microorganisms then it gets shit out again as ethyl mercury which is a horrific neurotoxin which travels up the food chain and accumulates you know it bioaccumulates in mammals that eat it and at the top of the food chain northern manitoba well that's my people it's cree people you know we're the ones who get the majority of that toxic burden from that you know climate warping so-called green industry sorry i was all triggered by what, what our what our brother was talking about um and it's maddening right um and so i think that like you know what this current climate crisis the existential threat of climate change and like all of this crazy like international like market meltdown um you know the the, the pandemic um you know the 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 type of teardown required for the economic system uh to deal with the existential threat of climate change to have a just transition off of fossil fuel dependency off of fossil fuel addiction um you know this moment provides us with such a tremendous opportunity to do that while at the same time tackling a very complicated discourse and 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 just just collective and, and, and interpersonal and individual challenge that we as a society face which is going through which is the only way through a very messy process of truth and reconciliation of coming to terms with canada's controversial genocidal colonial past its ongoing neo-colonial practice of colonial expansion through the private sector extractivism that is happening particularly in the north most acutely and you know we have an opportunity to tear that down and to build something up in a way that finally gets it right you know we have an opportunity to turn the cart before the the horse with the global climate crisis uh here in canada and 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 really take a good hard look at ourselves um and a good look at some of the stats you know indigenous peoples represent the biggest labor force entering our economy over the decades to come second in line only to migrants and immigrants so it's basically a bunch of brown and black people that are going to be the dominant workforce in our economy over the next 20 years you know and and you know and i'm, I'm you know any labor people in the audience i'm calling out big labor you know big labor needs to step up in a framework of international solidarity the way that they have historically always done and open up those war chests and start funding indigenous people's social movements, undocumented workers, you know, and investing in those marginalized, the most marginalized sectors of the Canadian economy as we tackle the issue of just transition, you know, as we tackle, um, you know, the dismantling of predatory capitalism and creating something new that doesn't create national sacrifice zones all over Canada, you know, when the reality, you know, the majority of card-carrying, tax-paying, law-abiding Canadian citizens live within 50 kilometers of the U.S. border. The rest of Canada is Indigenous peoples, It's you know, predominantly. That's changing very rapidly with climate migration, but the, the, the reality of environmental racism right now in Canada is, is, is that it sits, the burden of it sits disproportionately on Native people. It's not to say that there aren't poor Black and even poor disenfranchised white communities that face environmental discrimination, but for the most part, it's native people. It's Inuit in the circumpolar regions, it's Métis Hamlets, it's one of the 631st nations. If you take a map of all of the most toxic, climate-destroying, undemocratic, you know, just messy extractive projects in this country, whether it's oil sands, mining, forestry, en masse, fisheries, they are operating either right adjacent to or very near to one of our communities, okay? And it's right there. You can see it in the maps, okay? 
And so, you know, I, I think I think for for the climate movement to to center indigenous leadership, I mean that that has already happened to a certain degree over the decades. Like if you are a buff of an environmental movement like I am, you'll see that there has not been a major environmental victory won in Canada in 50 years without First Nations or Inuit or Métis communities at the helm, leading the charge with a, with a, a rights-based campaigning framework, okay? Supported by the environmental movement and other social movement sectors, supported by the liberal, you know, wealthy elite funders, right? It, it's been that way since the, since the freaking get-go, all right? And, and and I think that, you know, it, it, this this question, it, it falls into the vein of like the way that we see the world. And one of the big challenges with the truth and reconciliation movement, you know, the movement to implement uh, to, as quick as we can in the best, most thorough way that we can, the 94 calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the, 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 the way that we do that, um, you know, there, there's some fundamental ways that we need to change our, our understanding of, of, of how wealth is accumulated in, in, in these lands that they call Canada. It is not that the native is the freeloader. We're not. Indigenous peoples have been subsidizing the accumulation of Canadian wealth within the trust relationship, the treaty relationship, uh, for, for since the inception of this very young settler colonial state. You know, and we will continue to win in the settler colonial courts, you know, our assertions of territorial jurisdiction. We will continue to build power and to build our economies in the diversity that, that my sister Leah described in our nations, right? Because we're not a monolith, you know? We're not this pan-Indigenous identity that the settler colonial state, could, you know, every government iteration continues to try and impose on us. No, you know? And, and Canadians need to understand that, you know, that the only way that wealth has been accumulated in these lands is no different than the states. It's through stolen labor, through stolen land, you know, with power that has been grabbed by the police apparatus of a apartheid state agenda. Because make no mistake, we're living in an apartheid country. The Indian Act is an apartheid piece of legislation. And it is required for Canada's economy as it currently exists to be successful. And so for 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 I think I think the climate movement to strengthen, there's some there's some fundamentals at the foundational piece of knowledge and perception, a worldview and cosmo vision that I think the movement collectively needs to work on, like embracing. And it, you know, if not embracing entirely, at least being empathetic towards and understanding, because we're all headed in the same direction, you know. Um, and how we get there and the messiness of that process and the mistakes that we make and make and make and make again, you know, could be lessened if we communicate within a framework of international solidarity that takes into consideration some fundamental idea shifts, you know, and, and I think that the, the second piece, and I'll end with this, is that whatever we do as social movements and whatever Canada does to, you know, implement the 94 calls to action, this is inextricably linked to whatever Canada does on adaptation and mitigation in relation to the existential threat of climate change. Um, because at the end of the day, colonization caused climate change. You know, climate change is a root, um, um, you know, symptom of the, of the actual problem, which is predatory capitalism. Um, you know, it's our economic system. And, um, you know, one of the ways that, 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 that we're going to change that is uh, by a radical teardown and rebuild, um, you know, in a framework of uh, anti-racism, anti-colonialism, um, anti-oppression. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, each of you for your words. Um, I've just been sitting here, like taking that all in. Um, if I can, I think maybe attempt to like pull out a few things that that really spoke to me. And I'll I'll repeat the question <laughs> one more time, which was around. Um, I think especially what came out was how how do you think conversations and actions would be different? What would the how would the climate movement look different? Um, if Indigenous leadership uh, was centralized. And what I was kind of jotting down here is just um, 
that it would be more grounded. We wouldn't have this level of uh, abstraction that I think the conversation can get into when we're talking about uh, energy and we're talking about development and we're talking about cost benefit analysis and kind of the abstract and we're uh, not talking about the land and we're not talking about communities. So I think, um, uh, yeah, making sure that we remain grounded in the land um, and in those like social aspects um, would be perhaps one difference. Um, and uh, yeah, and secondly, just that um, more uh, holistic lens to climate action. Um, and I, I don't think that I can summarize everything that you all mentioned, but you know, climate is connected to policing, to militarized violence against indigenous women and girl girls, um, to global solidarity around the world, um, to capitalism, of course, um, and that we have to uh, I really liked what you said, uh, Leah, like challenging the equation of, of capitalism and extraction with prosperity, that there are other ways that, that our communities can prosper. Um, uh, I have, uh, so, so there's three questions for this panel, and uh, we spent an hour talking about the first one, which is great. And I, yeah, again, really value everything that you guys um, offer just now. Um, and so I think, I guess maybe I'm gonna ask you guys what you feel like talking about next. We have a second question, which I think would be still very valuable to hear from you guys on, which is basically around um, non-Indigenous organizations and individuals often talk about being allies and standing in solidarity with Indigenous organizations, activists and land defenders. Um, at its best, this can build power, but it can also be um, problematic. We're getting into issues of like tokenism and kind of um, that kind of demonstrative allyship. Um, and so kind of speaking to, to that a little bit and what are more effective ways for supporting solidarity. Um, and if I can say one thing I wanted to bring out, I think Clayton, you already made a really good point around that, which is uh, as non-Indigenous climate activists, I don't think our goal should be stand in solidarity with Indigenous communities. It should be what are we all fighting for? And what is our shared vision around, um, you know, prosperous communities, safe communities, and at the end of capitalism. <laughs> um, so I guess um, either kind of using that as a jumping, jumping off point perhaps and, and offering a little bit more on that question, or maybe we could take some questions from the audience. Leah, it looked like you were raising the mic to your, not the other, okay. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, does anybody well, have I'm, some thoughts? I'm open to a question, like, just because I know our time is limited. If there's a question, does anybody have a question for me that they've... Yeah, okay. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Adam. I host a radio show called Not Necessarily the Automobile on UMFM. I'm also Métis and interested in transportation equity. Um, I'm in the belief that you can't create climate justice without transportation equity. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on how we can, I guess, build better movements within public transportation, active transportation to tread lightly and get away from fossil fuels. So, I mean, I, like we live, I mean, if we want to focus on Winnipeg, I, like we're like a, a public transport, transport desert, right? And like, I think movements like this matter, um, you know, in terms of uh, like pushing for greater investment in public transit, but also something that I dream of is a proper rail system uh, throughout the country. You know, we have we have a railway throughout the country, but our current system is so slow that even though I love the train, like I don't have three days to make it to Ottawa. You know, I go, you know, I mean, that's the reality, you know, and I'm, it's not the 1800s uh, in Ottawa and I don't stay there for a certain amount of time a year 
and the amount of fossil fuels I burn going back and forth to Ottawa, if we had a proper rail system, I mean, let's let's advocate for that. But I also want to talk about transportation uh, in terms of a gender equality issue, just because I'm the woman here. And so I want to bring that gendered lens. But um, um, on the, what is it, Winnipeg Trails. So they had this program that they put uh, in place uh, providing bikes to newcomer women uh, as a form of transportation uh, in the city in terms of being able to have transport, not just, uh, you know, as a way of free transport, but also a, a way of independence to be able to get to places to and fro. We need to support more programs like that, whether it's active transportation, uh, not looking at things like psych and, and building active transportation networks uh, in the city, more bike trails, uh, but it takes investment and it takes uh, commitment. I don't see that level, like politically from where I'm sitting, I don't see that level of commitment federally. I It's a nowhere's land provincially. Hopefully that will change with the new government or municipally. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in Winnipeg Center, especially around the, um, the not just the West End, but um, uh, like the Brooklyn's area, uh, uh, area to have active transportation networks. Um, but we need investment. We need federal buy-in. Uh, we need uh, municipal buy-in and provincial buy-in. With the economy the way it is, uh, if you look at the current uh, budget that the last federal budget that came out, not only was it an austerity budget, but if you read the budget lines, it was also a resource extraction budget. Uh, whether it was in, in regards to discussions around relationships with Indigenous peoples, um, but also um, in terms of, you know, generating revenue where revenues were going to come from that takes public pressure uh that takes public push to make it a critical uh, election issue most of the questions most of the debates uh that occur in the in the house of commons right now aren't about active transportation it's very low on the radar most of the discussions uh, center around resource extraction whether directly or indirectly, that will take a lot of public pressure to change that discourse. So um, that's a movement issue. And I say that because I always say I have the most unimportant position because I'm always one vote away from losing my job. Like if there's anybody that's replaceable in this place we now call Canada, it's politicians, right? We decide platforms. I'm not saying I do. I think I'm a little different that way. I'm a bit wild. But we we decide platforms based on power, maintaining power and privilege. Right? That's what that's what centers most of the positions that happen uh, in, in political discourse at the House of Commons uh, level. If we know that not taking a very clear position on public transportation will cost us our seat, you better be believe that politicians around this country will be taking clearer positions on public transportation, active transit. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Were there any other questions or from folks online? Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much, uh, the panelists. Um, so impressed with all the discussion going around. And by the way, I can't know your name. Sounds like um, I mean, from my uh, ethnic community. Uh, I'm from originally from Nigeria. So we, I don't know if any of you know about a popular international footballer called Kanu Wankwa, so from my tribe. So I don't know if it's pronounced that some way. So that shows how connected uh, we are all, uh, right? Um, Wherever we are coming from, we have uh, a lot of things in common and also originally from a country that's been impacted by colonization. And uh, currently I'm working on indigenous uh, food security issues around white rice or manumi 
as it is called in, in the indigenous community, uh, in Broken Head. So thank you so much again. I have a lot of thoughts, questions. <laughs> I jotted down, so uh, it's more than four of them. So I probably will just um, uh, ask a few because of uh, time and all that. So um, thank you, Honorable Minister. And um, uh, you did, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Honorable MP, uh, Leah, you did a lot, of, you made a lot of uh, thought-provoking statement and as a politician. So uh, again, I, I appreciate uh, all those thoughts uh, with your position as well. Uh, so you talked about, um, um, uh, so one of the questions that I, I have, you, you just mentioned that, how would it uh, it be different uh, when indigenous people in charge? Uh, I didn't get um, a, a kind of, maybe I missed it, but I didn't get a definitive um, um comment from you how how it will be different and um also you talked a lot about economic power uh which is quite important because uh in economic power you need also exchange of goods and services and um we are not living in better trade systems so you have to exchange something and in the global world uh you have to exchange what you have uh to, to for instance uh, the jeans we are all wearing it takes about um uh, from what i looked at uh, it takes about 1800 gallons to grow cotton and then about um, six seven thousand six hundred to produce a pair of jeans that we're all wearing a lot of the wearing jeans so that water comes from the environment and probably uh, from other country to that we import uh, to, to 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 keep ourselves warm by wearing jeans so and if we're going to have to trade jeans for other resources so we also probably will have to be mindful of how what we are using is impacting other other countries as well other indigenous people uh, of course um hydroelectricity uh, like um Clinton mentioned uh we, we're talking about uh, uh, manumin uh, part of the reason why Manitoba and producing manumin is because of uh, flooding from Manitoba Hydro. Of course, uh, we also talk about electricity generation through nuclear. And to generate electricity from nuclear power, it takes about uh, 200, uh, 270 to 670 gallons of water, depending on the efficiency. So again, I'm, I'm just talk, uh, asking what are the alternatives that we can, and taking into perspective, uh, that we live in a global world. Whatever that we do here impact people in other countries, vice versa. And um, the other one talks about uh, um, uh, the Indian Act, uh, which is a question that I asked uh, the Prime Minister last year. Uh, it's recorded by CBC. I asked him, why do we still have the Indian Act? Because I've been attending a workshop that says abolish the Indian Act. That's at the University of Manitoba. Uh, and um, it baffles me why we still have that Indian Act up until now. And if I don't want to go into details about the response by the Prime Minister, but it's on CBC, it's on YouTube, anybody can find uh, that out because I asked that question. So why do we still have that around? Why do we, why are we not actively in, involved in our discussions uh, to let people know, especially the immigrant community, which I'm one of them, about this Indian Act? And part of the things that we know about indigenous people are all distorted information, not accurate. So how do we actively push to ensure that both the young Canadians and immigrant Canadians understand some of these dynamics? I, I hope um, some of my questions make sense. I, I actually, one thing I wonder about is why, why do we have the Canadian state? Right, we they they have the Indian Act to uh, d decide their relationship with uh, Indigenous people, uh, with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people, and uh, that's uh, that directs that, right? But the formation of the Canadian state is something that is um, it doesn't need to be permanent. Uh, it is it's here now, uh, and. There's a, you know, and we're all here as people and like how we govern ourselves does not need to be the Canadian government, right? Um, so whether the Indian Act is is part of that, it isn't in my opinion. Um, but the specific relationship and recognition that First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people were here first and have uh, still hold that responsibility to this land, um, to their communities, their cultures, and and really are planning to be here for forever, right? For generations to come, right? I, 
one thing I, I I'm from uh, Northwest Ontario, lots of logging and mining out there. And always so frustrating to me to see how, uh, you know, you, there's this rush to mine and scrape all the gold out of uh, a, a particular mine. And then people just leave. Same thing with logs, same thing with every extraction project there. It's just this rush to get it out there. And I can just see 50 years from now, who's going to be living there and who's going to be cleaning up that mess. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the Indian Act thing, eh? Like, like, I mean, again, it go. It stems back to like perception and 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 you know, just this 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 consistent like narrative and and worldview that Indigenous peoples have to deal with in terms of dealing with other members of humanity or social movement sectors or sectors of the economy. Um, you know, the Indian Act is a piece of apartheid legislation. I mean, the Indian Act is what's what what inspired the Bintu stance, you know, system in South Africa, right? Like like Soweto, where Nelson Mandela grew up, like that shit was based on Indian reservation policy here in Canada. They did a fact finding mission to Canada before they did that in South Africa. Um, so Canada is like crimes, like it's crime of like cultural genocide that came from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, you know, to the removal of children from their homes and from their language and their culture is genocide under the Geneva Code of Genocide. Um, and for that to occur through apartheid legislation, like the Indian Act, you know, because every one of you in this room, you're governed, you know, and your your rights afforded to you are through the Charter of Rights and Freedom, right? That, that, that's a large, that's a the legislation that that's law, right? But for First Nations, we're governed by the Indian Act outside of the Charter and Rights of Freedom. And the number one freaking thing about the Charter and Rights of Freedom is that you have what's called mobility of rights, okay? So if you decide, oh, I'm sick of Manitoba, I'm going to go to Vancouver, warmer climate that does not stop you from accessing universal health care you don't all of a sudden you know you can go to school in bc you can work in bc you can rent or buy property there right um whereas indigenous peoples as soon as you leave the reservations all of a sudden you have to you you you're you're, you're subject to taxation um which we aren't supposed to be um taxed um, and so the mobility of rights issue is a big issue with the Indian Act. But at the same breath, I would say that, you know, the federal government of Canada entered into the trust relationship between the crown and each individual 636 First Nations across this country. And they have the same fiduciary and legal obligation collectively to each one of those individual nations. And so the pace and scale of decolonization, of getting out of the paternalistic, racist, white supremacist, misogynistic Indian Act legislation, that process and scale and time frame is up to each individual First Nation, not Canada, not the courts, not municipalities like Winnipeg, not provinces or territorial governments. It's up to that specific First Nation and the settler colonial state of Canada. It's like a process, you know what I mean? And there have been attempts, um, you know, by, you know, prominent First Nations leaders like, you know, former Grand Chief Phil Fontaine, who here in Manitoba created the Framework Agreement Initiative in the 90s to dismantle Indian affairs and to transfer the administration of the Indian Act. Um, which was a blanket response of the settler colonial state to treaties. Okay, they tried to do a pan-Indigenous response, which was the Indian Act, but they never actually honored the treaties. We've never actually implemented the treaties yet, at least on the Native side. You know, Canada's really gotten rich off of the treaty relationship. But so this is a very complex and nuanced thing when you bring up the Indian Act and why does it still exist? Why do some Native people not be as loud as others about it you know because there are some out there that are like let's get rid of it it's over it's done but it's not that simple you know and there are complexities you know there are eight billion dollars plus of transfer payments and health care and housing and 
education, uh, um, you know, and in 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 land based not u- utilization and planning, that are all wound up in the Indian Act, right? And on the federal government side of things, they want to transfer the responsibility of the administration of that. And they do that already through the existing relationship. And that's why First Nations are in a never ending cycle of debt and third party receivership is because the Indian Act was never supposed to be a system of governance to succeed for the fastest growing population in the Canadian economy. It was designed for a group of people that were going to eventually disappear through assimilation. Right. So, yeah, it's a very nuanced question you bring up. So just a couple of things. Uh, in the last parliament, we passed Bill C-15, uh, to, which and it was already to ensure that all legislation going forward was consistent with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, you know, um, where there is a recognition of individual and collective rights and mobility of those rights. Um, The federal government, in terms of dismantling the Indian Act, is still using an interim, what I call an incremental approach to dismantling. I'll give you a a most recent example that will be coming uh, before Parliament, is Bill C-38, to amend uh, uh, the act to take out sexual discrimination against Indigenous women, uh, where Indigenous women uh, lost uh, like status under the Indian Act uh, to, to reinstate it. So we're currently in the stage of negotiation. Uh, there are leaders uh, like women that have fought against sex discrimination in the Indian Act for many years. And the government is still looking at, um, you know, making incremental change. Usually these changes occur because of Supreme Court rulings. So a lot of uh, getting out of the Indian Act happens uh, court ruling by court ruling by court ruling. The other issue is that when they do pass back our our, uh, right to self-determination over things like water, for example, Bill C-61 that's currently before the House, it's often without resources. We often often get uh, the resource with all the liabilities without resources. Okay, so an important bill, I think, to this forum would be C-61, Bill C-61, which uh, will be be before the House, go into study in in committee. Um, That was the point of Bill C-15, was to replace what Clayton said, the Indian Act, which is a human rights violating apartheid document, with human rights. But going back to what I said earlier, it's one thing to change legislation, it's another thing to change colonial behavior. One of the uh, amendments that I successfully made to the National Child Care Plan, because it is all interrelated and interconnected, is to include uh, uh, an article uh, affirming the free prior, and if, with these words, this was historic, the free prior and informed consent on all matters related to children. The liberals voted against it. Why? Because they're not worried about our children. They're worried about money. I'm currently doing this about adoptive and kinship care and the EI, a new EI legislation. They're worried that this this precedent-setting acknowledgement, even though it's already uh, affirmed with Bill C-15, by acknowledging free prior and informed consent in a legislation, my guess is because they're worried it's now going to apply to resource extraction, which is why they fought it. But I won. Right? We won. Yeah. I think we're going to have to wrap it up there. But uh, thank you, each of you, so much for such a a rich conversation. Um, We could obviously talk about these things all day we could listen to the four of you all day and thank you for the couple of questions there um 
yeah, you guys are uh, welcome to stick around and chat with folks if, if you like, or I know you're also all busy people that have other things to do as well, perhaps. Um, but thank you again um, for being here and sharing your knowledge and experiences. Can I close with a song? Thank you, everyone. That was such an enriching I'm just trying to close with a panel. Quick, just okay, yeah. Lips. Yeah, come on. Just close with a nice song. Visualize something positive that the, whatever the goals and outcomes are of this gathering, eh? Just that you all put your hearts and minds together and do something good for our people. Thank you so much. That was that was beautiful. You have a wonderful voice. I just wanted to tell you that. <laughs> um, yeah, so feel free to grab a snack. We're going to set up the Zoom uh, as we'll be introducing S Sarah shortly to do a workshop with everyone.